Sunrise Tech was a very profitable company in LA. The profits were exceeding the last year, over and over year on year, for the last five years. This was all put down to the CEO, Clark Sellers. He was a technological genius. The profits and success were overshadowed last Christmas by his sudden suicide. He jumped from the roof of Sunrise Tech Headquarters. After that, COVID-19 cases got so bad, everyone in the company were told to work at home. This was easy for such a company because mostly everyone could work from at home, no problem. The company was shut up on Christmas night. Little did the employers know then that they wouldn't return to work until early, not early in the new year, but the new year after that. It was New Year's Eve and Pat was a cleaner who was cleaning in the building, getting it ready for the new year, for the return to work. He came across Clark's desk and felt sad knowing that last year's Christmas card was still there. Then he thought to himself, wait, no, not last year's, the one before, because they had been closed since then. He wondered did he even have the chance to read who it was from. He felt a pang of sadness. Pat opened the card and read the word, jump. A few minutes later, Pat made his way out to the roof and jumped off, just like Clark did after reading his Christmas card the day he jumped to his death. Pat knew as he was falling down from the sky, Clark didn't commit suicide, because no matter how much he wanted to fight the urge to not walk to the roof and not jump, he couldn't after reading the word on the Christmas card. Jump. Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Mary's mom told the parents of the other kids to not pay no attention to her imaginary friends and don't laugh at them. So they did what they were told and just played along when she was speaking to her imaginary friends. They were all anti-bullying and didn't want Mary to feel left out. It was Christmas Eve and Mary and her friends were having a Christmas party, really excited about opening their gifts in the morning. One of the girls, Sarah, decided to play a game of hide and seek. Mary said, My friend Susie said she doesn't want to play as she had an accident playing it before and fell down the stairs. It was on Christmas Eve also. Sarah said, of course we can play Mary. Plus, we won't go near the stairs. We will shut the hall door and just play in the rooms not near any stairs. Mary eventually agreed and they all found their hiding places. Sarah found this door that she never remembered seeing before. But before she knew what it was, she fell down the stairs towards the basement. By the time she hit the floor, she was dead. It took just a few minutes to Mary find her. She started screaming and she was so upset that she had forgot there was a stairs going down to the basement. She put the light on and could see Sarah down below and knew she must have been dead as she was lying in a pool of blood. Suddenly all the girls screamed when they saw a girl kneeling next to Sarah below and she looked up at them with a sinister smile. They all screamed and ran to tell their parents of the girl they just saw. Their parents were mad at them for using an imaginary person as an excuse to cover up for what really happened. But one of the moms played along, but she guessed what did happen. 
It was the same girl she saw in her dreams every night. The girl who she babysat years and years ago. And she never forgave herself for not watching her war. And the girl never forgave her either. Because if she did watch her more, she would have never fallen down those stairs. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content, then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. No one speaks of 44 Cedar Road on a street lined with family homes, each with decorated front yards and fresh cut grass, there stands another. No tragedy took place within its walls, no murders or assaults. No one had ever died in that house. In fact, no one has ever lived in it. Over the years, there have been many offbeat and strange theories of its darkness, from the belief that it was built atop a portal to hell to a curse, the one idea most people choose to believe is the simplest one, the one that rings true to anyone who stands outside, looks upon the house, it is simply this, neglect. All things have a purpose. Whether it comes from man or nature, each thing on earth was put here for a reason. This house, built only some 35 years ago, sometime in the late 1980s in fact, was constructed to be a family home, but it never came to be. From economic recessions, bad timing and luck, the house was never sold. Each time a family came to walk its halls and speak of a potential future, the neighbors discerned a brightness about the place. When those families would leave, only to find another home and another place, the house grew darker, its neat wood and glass feeling small to any observer. Year after year, open house after open house, it was left discarded, each day seeming less like a home, each day growing more distant like a thing not of its neighborhood or any other, a thing not built, rather placed here, between two very real homes and across from another, close enough so it could see and hear the neighboring families. As the years passed, its shades grew longer in the sun, its paint dim in the afternoon light. As a thing not of this world, the house remained there, the smallness it once portrayed now gone. Some thirty odd years later after its construction, with years and decades of emptiness inside, it grew strong, it grew hollow and vengeful. It grew haunted. The tragedy which is most infamously associated with the house is that of the Aaron Solinsky disappearance. According to police reports, the boy was last seen by a friend who resided on the far end of Cedar Road. When Aaron left his friend's home, he would have had to walk past the house to reach his own home. His mother called the station after two hours of searching, believing her son to be simply out with other friends or riding his bike. Once it was determined the boy was truly missing, the search began, first in the fields and skate parks before moving to house to house canvassing. In the intervening hours, when Aaron's mother was still searching, a call came to the station. It was the man who lived beside 44 Cedar Road. He claimed to have heard screams coming from inside the house. What he did not tell police at the time is that he, his wife, and children were terrified of the screams. It sounded like someone was getting their limbs torn off, he said. They were agonizing screams. Two officers responded. Author Simon Hedges, who worked on finding and exposing the strange phenomena, would later try to find the two men but had no luck. Both officers left the force after the incident. The police report was spare, saying only that they entered the house and saw nothing out of the ordinary. After clearing it, the men left. When the officers were questioned further, as it became more apparent that the missing boy may have gone inside the house, the men denied having seen anything of import. Detective Ron Ford, who led the missing person's investigation, wrote in his notes that the officers showed signs of deception. He privately considered them suspects. It is likely that he would have pursued it, if not for the complete lack of evidence. He later wrote he did not believe they had anything to do with the disappearance, but knew more than they were saying. Nothing ever came of the investigation. From time to time, there would be an open house for buyers who knew nothing of the house. A young couple, typically newlyweds, would walk through its halls, examine the structure as the real estate agent tried to sell the unsellable. It would pretend to sleep. It would be dormant while they moved inside. Within 20 minutes, the house would spit them out, and all involved would be happy for the encounter to be over. 
But when only one or two people went inside, these were the times when stories would sprout. Urban legends spread like wildfire for months after one of these occurrences, such as that of the two officers, or most famously, the contractor. The contractor had been hired by the owner of the house to see if it was possible to turn it into dental offices. An out-of-town dentist had been searching locations and this, he had told the owner, would work very well. The contractor did not survive his encounter. His statement was not taken by the police, but the doctor who treated him. The doctor posted the following on the message board a few weeks later after the contractor's death. May 3rd, 2017. What I am about to relay is not on my own experience, and therefore I cannot promise it is all true. All I can say is that the man who told it to me was on the verge of death and had no reason to lie. He had been a healthy man a week prior, and the autopsy the day following his death showed no signs of trauma to the brain. Here is what he said. He had entered the house on 44 Cedar Road early in the morning of April 16th to take measurements. He recalled feeling strange as he took photos of the house as if he were intruding on someone's privacy. After an hour of work, he packed his equipment into the duffel bag and crossed the living room to the front door which had not been locked. Upon opening the door, he became disoriented by what he saw. Instead of opening to the outside, the door revealed a stairway leading down. He closed the door and checked the windows. Outside the glass, he could see the people on the sidewalk. He tried the door again, thinking perhaps he was imagining what he saw. But the stairwell was there again. He tried the back door, finding the same steps. He tried the windows opening and then banging, breaking, but there was no reaction from the glass, as if it were not glass at all, but rather an invisible film separating him from the rest of the world. After beating his hands raw on every surface that led to the outside, he told me that he sat in the bare living room and wept. When the tears stopped, he simply sat there. It was in this silence that he heard the water upstairs. Though the house had no running water since it had originally been built, someone had now turned the shower on the second floor. The contractor rose from his stupor, a hammer in hand, and climbed the steps. As he reached the landing, there came a humming from the bathroom, almost completely veiled by the rush of falling water. But it was there, hollow and awkward, as if not coming from human vocal cords, but a poor imitation. The doorway to the bathroom stood ajar, steam spilling out. The contractor, terrified and already in a state of near hysteria, raised the hammer as he pushed the door open. He stared off while telling me what he saw there, as if he could not understand, as if he wasn't sure it had been real at all. It was the shape of a person, he said, blurred behind the shower curtain. But the longer he stared, the more he realized it wasn't the plastic that made it hard to discern the person on the other side, because it was not a person at all. It too was a poor imitation of a human being. He turned back toward the staircase, but from below, another humanoid shape was walking up. The contractor ran down the hall and into the back bedroom. There was no furniture, and the closet had no door. He simply had no place to hide. Again, he tried the windows. But again, it was to no avail. It was from this view that he saw the neighboring home. The curtain on the windows obscured the people inside, making them look like nothing but shapes. He wondered then if this was what the house believed families to look like. The water in the hall cut out and he could hear them there, mumbling, staggering. And soon they were searching. It didn't take long before the door opened and he was found. They were so happy, he told me, so happy when they found me. At this, he wept. He would not say more, only that when he found himself outside, he thought he had been in the house for weeks, but it had only been hours. Over the next few days, he deteriorated, body and mind, every day telling me something new. On his last day of living, he was not much more than a corpse. With his last breath, he told me this. They sang to me. Every night, they sang me to sleep.
Thanks for watching the Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. Hello, my name is Jason. The night my life changed, I could sense something was wrong. I knew it was, from the smell of danger that was in the air. I knew there were people in my house. I could feel their presence. I tried to stay calm and relax, as if nothing was wrong, but I knew that I was in danger. I knew any moment that there would be a knock on my door. I couldn't hear speaking, I couldn't even hear breathing except my own, but I knew there were people in my house and that those people would bring me so much trouble, so much pain. Suppose I could leave now, just walk out that door or run out that door. But wait, I hear something. Then I heard a knock on the door. There is no point in hiding from what is out to get me. I opened the door and saw a policeman. I was relieved. Then I pulled out my gun and shot the policeman, relieved that at least now I know I have a head start to leave this damn place. I got into my car and drove and drove, knowing I have to change my identity again. Those people I've shot in the head in my home would bring me so much trouble. I know they would. It's a shame I have to do it all again, somewhere else, make friends, throw a party and kill them all. The rush, oh the rush of killing them, nothing compares to it. But why do the damn police have to always ruin me trying to enjoy my hobby? For watching the assassin rapper and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content Jake saw an ad online for a life coach with a guaranteed plan to make their life better in every single way. Jake thought it was just a load of marketing and advertising rubbish trying to sell an idea that clearly wouldn't work in any way. But he was hating his life so much he thought to himself what harm would it do? He made an appointment by sending an email and he arrived in the office the next day. The man introduced himself. Hello Jake, nice to meet you. My name is Robert Sampson. I am very pleased and thankful that you chose to do my course. This is a plan that has been guaranteed to work. Just you wait and see. Your life is going to take a huge turn for the better and you will be happier than you ever were. You will be happier than you ever imagined. All you need to do is relax and go with the flow of the plan and you will find that your life is absolutely amazing and you will finally be able to feel the power of now. You will be able to focus on what you love and who you love and be able to get rid of all the negative energy that is holding you back. The session lasted for about an hour. Within days Jake's life had started to get so much better, just like Robert had promised him. He was so happy. He met a new girlfriend called Brooke and they had a great day out in the carnival. The next day he went swimming, which he loved 
but recently hadn't the mind to go. A week later he even joined a band and became the lead singer, which he always dreamt of doing, but didn't have the courage. If that wasn't enough, himself and his new girlfriend Brooke travelled to countries they had only dreamt of going to, but now could afford because of the money that was rolling in from the band's success. Robert was very happy with the progress he was finally achieving. He hated the teething problems with his other subjects, and that was a shame those very nice people looking for help only to wind up dead. He felt stupid that he didn't take into account they would die of hunger and thirst. But this was going to be different. He sorted that problem. These pots wouldn't let Jake die like the others who were plugged into the Digiverse created to them feel here and see a world that was beautiful and amazing. But these pods should be able to solve that problem. Jake doesn't know either about the Digiverse. He doesn't know he's in a pod. If he would, wouldn't he freak out? Of course. Robert looked into the pod at Jake wondering how his life in the Digiverse was going. Thanks for watching The Assassin Rapper, and if you enjoy the content then make sure to subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content.